man, we may have a small church, but I mean, if you, if they broke it down statistic wise, like retention rate, like of how many folks stay for the second service too, compared to other churches, I, this is a blessing. This is a blessing. We might we might not have that many people, but the people we do have, they're here for the for the truth. They're here for the right reasons, right? Yeah. Nehemiah chapter two, and that was that was great stuff, brother Tom. I really enjoyed that. Thank you for that. Praise the Lord. That's right. That's so it's always good. <laughs> Can't go wrong once the word of God. Nehemiah chapter 2 and we'll look at verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 2 and we'll read verse 1. And we're going to read verses 1 all the way to 10. And it came to pass in the month Nisan in the 20th year of our dessert seats the king that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste? And the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldst send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I came to the governors beyond the river, and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sanballat the Horonite, and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we love you. Uh, thank you so much for bringing us here today. I pray, Lord, that you would get me 100% out of the way right now of your word and what you have for these people. I pray, Father, that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit till my cup runneth over. I need the washing of your precious, sinless blood today, Lord Jesus. And you know what? Everyone in here needs to be washed in your blood so that they would hear the words of God and have a soft heart to it, Lord, that we have a, would have a good spirit in this room, that we would not be hindered at all. I pray that you give me boldness and that you give me confidence, Lord, in only your word and what you have uh, for these people today. And I pray that you use it for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So what we have here, Nehemiah, as you can, as we just read, uh, he went before the king and he was going on behalf of his people. I don't know if you, uh, if you folks were all here last time I preached, but I preached on recognizing the need, some things that we need to get right internally and inside before we can go try to build up someone else's wall or build up a city. Well, today I want to look at practically some things that once you get those things right, um, what you're going to have to be prepared to do. So today my title is Preparation and Equipment. Preparation and Equipment. And my first point, the first thing that you're going to have to be prepared to do is you're going to have to be prepared to push. Prepared to push. Look at verse 1 again. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. So the first thing that you're going to have to be prepared to do, you're going to have to be prepared for sadness. If you're going to do anything at all for God, if you're going to hang in there, and if you're going to be used by God, you're going to 
there's going to get some bouts of sadness. Some of the greatest men of God throughout history, they were actually, they had bouts of depression themselves. And so we see Nehemiah here, and it's kind of funny because Nehemiah, he was the cupbearer. His job was to bring wine to the king. And so the whole point of wine, if you look at the verses in the Bible, is to bring like cheer and gladness and to make you happy. So it's kind of like Nehemiah, it's like, I don't know if you've ever seen any of those, like you had one job compilations on like YouTube, but he literally, your one job is to just come out, give the king the wine, it'll make him happy, and then you go away. And it says Nehemiah, he had never been sad in the presence of the king before. And so it's kind of like if you ever go to Starbucks early in the morning, and it's super, it's super early, and you go in there, you're tired, you want to get your coffee, and the barista's back there, and the barista has like everything known to man that could give you energy. Like they have the co coffee maker, espresso machine, they have everything, right? Green tea, anything. And you always go in and they're always just like, oh, they're like, take your order and there's like leaning and they like slide you your drink and they're like getting the crusties out of their eyes still. And you're just like, it's kind of weird. You're like, I'm coming here to be energized, like to get energy. And I mean, Thank God coffee will still give you energy. But it's just kind of contradictory. It's like, I come there, I expect you, like, if anything, you should be, you should have energy. You should be, you know, peppy at Starbucks, right? You have, by all means, if you need a minute, take a minute, right. pour yourself a cup, I'll be here, drink it, and then, you know, come back to me. Phil's does a better job of this, by the way. I will say that. Phil's, they're much peppier. But they need to work on their lids. That's another sermon for another time. Um, so it, funny enough, Nehemiah, it's like he had one job and here he comes like, think about it. If you're in the king's shoes, the whole point of wine is like, you know, especially kings, presidents, heads of state, these powerful people, everything is positivity. Every, they, they don't want any negativity around them. They want everything to be smooth. And so you have Nehemiah, he's coming out, he's got the wine, and he walks it over the king, and the king's like, what? And Nehemiah was probably happy all the time before this, you know, he's, he had a good testimony, faithful guy, but he comes out all sad, and it says he had never before been sad in his presence, and that's a dangerous thing to be, sad in the king's presence in, in, in those times. If you said anything wrong, if you did anything wrong, if you looked the wrong way, if you, like, talked back to the king or anything, it would, it would mean your head. It would mean your head. It's not like today where you'll just get a written warning or like five or six of them. You won't even be fired because you could just sue the company. Um, if it was today, he probably just would have called in sick, right? He probably, was, oh, you know what? I'm just, I have a bitter, just, I have a bitter case of depression. I can't come in. And he wouldn't have had to come in. So Nehemiah, he at least pushed through his initial sadness. He pushed through that with like much greater consequences. You know, if he has a bad day on the job, he's dead, you know? For us, it's not, stakes aren't as high. But he didn't call in sick. He still went to work. And, I mean, he had, if you look at what he had, it, he wasn't sad because he didn't get enough likes on his super funny post or whatever he did. Literally, like, his city, his people are in ruin. And we saw for, before from chapter 1, I mean, it knocked him down. He was crying. He was praying, everything. And then he goes to the king, and he pushes through that sadness. And you need, to be, you need to know that it's okay to be sad because you're going to be sad. There's going to come times where you're sad. It's okay. Cry it out. Do whatever you have to do. Give it to the Lord. Um, but you shouldn't stay sad as a Christian. You shouldn't stay sad. Um, Psalms chapter 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Right? So, and it's funny, it's almost as simple as ABC when we get people saved, right? But joy, what does joy stand for? If you want pure, true joy, joy stands for Jesus, others, yourself. So if you're sad all the time, yeah, if you're, yeah, I heard that the other day. It was like, wow, that's so simple. Um, if, if you're sad all the time and you're super depressed, Honestly, it's probably because you're trying to be, you're trying to be Yaj. You're trying to be yourself, <laughs> others, Jesus. You're thinking about yourself all the time, right? So you need to push through your sadness. And uh, a great way that you do that is relying on God, thinking about how good God has been to you. Nehemiah, he, I mean, he's sad because he just got done praying for his people. But he comes, to the, he comes in the presence of the king. He pushes through that initial sadness. He was prepared for that because he had prayed beforehand. B, you're going to have to be prepared to push through your fear. 
through your fear. Now look at verses 2 and 3. So, now I had not been before time sad in his presence, verse 1. Verse 2, Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad? Seeing thou art not sick, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. So he was very sore afraid. It could be, I don't know, in my, in my mind's eye when I'm reading this, I'm thinking nine times out of ten, Nehemiah probably would just show up to work, bring the wine out. The king's already like, he's already there like this, <laughs> waiting for it. Nehemiah just gives him the thing, goes away. The king doesn't even like recognize him or doesn't even see him or notice him. But today of all days, he notices Nehemiah and he catches the king's attention and the king even, he, he calls him out for it. He's like, why are you sad? You're not sick, which lead me, leads me to believe back then people weren't sad unless they were sick, <laughs> unless there was actually like a real reason to look sad. So he calls him out on it. And Nehemiah, he is now very, very sore afraid. And so he's afraid, we're going to see here, because he's about to put it all on the line for his people. He is about to make a request to the king. He's about to, he just got done praying to God in the previous chapter. Now he's going to bring a, a a prayer request, if you will, to the king on behalf of his people. And if I'm him, I'm thinking, oh, great. I just, he just noticed me. Like I'm coming out, I'm going to ask him this question. He just noticed me. I'm all sad. And he called me out for it. Like, this is great. Now I'm going to ask him. He's probably never asked the king a favor before in his life. Why would he? He's the king. And the king takes notice of him. It's like totally on the wrong foot. And so he's very sore afraid, but look at how he pushes through that. Look how he pushes through that in verse 3. Uh, I was very sore afraid and said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. So not only does he come out, he sat in the king's presence. The king questions him and why he's sad. But Nehemiah turns right back around and he questions the king. And this reminds, this reminds me of uh, that woman that uh, caught Jesus in his words when he said, it's not meat to give the, the food to the, the dogs, right? But to the children. And she said, yay, Lord, but even the dogs, they, they get the crumbs, right? And what happened? Jesus gave her, gave her that. Um, that's what it reminds me of here with Nehemiah. He, he has the boldness, even though he's so afraid, he goes for it. And he pushes through that fear. And the reason he pushes through that fear is because he's getting ready to build something for God. So you need to be ready for these things. That's what I'm bringing all of this to you today because I want us to be prepared. Because if you're going off of what Brother Tom said, if you're going to do whatever it is you can do for God, whether you're young or you're old, rest assured these things are going to come into play. Brother Jack, I don't know, were, did you have any fear when you were about to sing today? You probably did a little bit maybe. Did you have any, yeah, did you have any fear when you're about to preach? I have fear right now. I'm going through, you know what I mean? Those things are going to come, but you need to know, uh, one, you need to be able be ready to push through that. And it's okay to ask yourself, okay, what am I really afraid of right here? Like be reasonable. Like it's okay to feel, feel that initial fear. That's, that's normal, but question it. Okay. What outcome am I afraid of that's going to happen right now? And, and why am I afraid? Um, if God be for us, who can be against us, right? And we know God called him to do this. And so if God has called you to do something, even when that sadness comes, that fear comes, all of those things, that's totally normal. Just so long as you don't stay sad, don't be paralyzed by your fear and your sadness. Push through those things. Proverbs 29, uh, verse 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So we see Nehemiah, he had some fear here of the king, but I like to think he feared God even more because he pushed through that. He pushed through that. And when you do that, God will bless it. And when it comes to asking yourself, why am I afraid? Where is this fear coming from? It's also been said um, that fear of anything other than God is a sin. Fear of anything other than God is a sin. So we know fear of God, beginning of wisdom, understanding, all of those things. But if you have that fear of God, it's going to domino effect all the rest of your life. And that's going to cause you to not ever be afraid of man. Don't be a respecter of persons. Just follow God. 
Uh, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So fear, that fear when you're doing something to serve God, like when we went out on the street corner today, and you know if there's any fear that came in before you initially open your mouth, when you're getting ready to, to do something like that and fear comes in, it's pretty easy to determine where that fear is coming from. It's not of God. God has not given us the spirit of fear. So that's my first point. We need to be uh, prepared to push through our sadness and our fear. I'll finish this point off with this verse, Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear Amen. no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So you should have no fear when God is near, right? And so if you're afraid all the time, if you're anxious and you're jittery and you're afraid to do this, oh, I can't possibly talk to someone about Jesus. I can't, I can't even give them a track. I can't do this. I can't do that. You need to know that that fear is not coming from God. And if you're always afraid, it's probably because you're not as close to God as you need to be. So you, get, you need to get closer to God. And then once you do this stuff over and over, like I'm, sh I'm sure folks that have gone out street preaching, door knocking, it just gets natural. And then you look, to, you look forward to it. You're like, oh, thank God, Lord, that you, you helped me push through that initial fear to where now I'm just reaping benefits. I'm reaping rewards here. This is enjoyable. And I'm, telling, like, I'm actually doing it out of love, out of love. So that's the first thing we need to be prepared for. You need to be prepared to be scared and be prepared to push through that and be prepared to be sad. That stuff's going to come as well. And a, like... I guess a cousin of sadness would be discouragement. That's one that usually gets a lot of folks is if it's not sadness, it's discouragement. And so those are all things that will hold you back from being ready to go out and build something for God and do something for God. And we need to be able to push through those. My second point, my second point is you need to be prepared to pray. Prepared to pray. Um, look at verse 4 again. Look at verse 4. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And then you see immediately after that one sentence in verse 5, And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight. So he literally, like on a momentary basis, Nehemiah prayed to God on the spot. This is key. This is vital for any Christian that's going to be effective and useful for God when it comes to witnessing, when it comes to preaching, any of that stuff. You need to be prepared to pray through, A, your open door. He has an open door right here. The king is going, for what dost thou make request? So if I'm Nehemiah, you know, in verse 3, I just got done questioning him and being like, of course I'm sad. My, my city is on fire. My people are ruined. Why wouldn't I be sad? And then for the king, there's probably like, there's probably just a, a mo, just a dead air for a moment where Nehemiah's just like, this is it. I'm about to get, this is it. And the king goes, for what dost thou make request? He's like, whoa, wow. He's like, this is how I know God's in this. Because have you ever gotten that where you ask someone, like a coworker, family member, whatever, that just seems like they'd never get saved or they don't like God? And then you just, it's welling up inside you. And you're, one day you're just like, hey, let me ask you this question. Are you 100% sure you would die? Uh, if you died right now, you'd go to heaven? And you'd never think that it would work. But then they pause for a second. They're like, well, no. And you have an open door. You're like, yes, praise the Lord. So what you need to be prepared to do when that time comes, because I'm telling you, it happens all the time. You need to be prepared to pray immediately on the spot. Even if it's literally like a, like literally right now as I'm preaching, there's a part of me that's praying. Like, God, like, give me the words to say next. I don't know what's going to happen, but please bless it. When I went uh, a few weeks back, when we went soul winning, uh, it was me, Brother Stan. And was it you or you? That was the guy that talked about his deformed daughter. That was you. So there's this guy that opens the door and... Um, Ask him the same question as always. And he goes, if God, if there is a, I can't even repeat the language he used, but he's like, if there is a God, then he's not good, basically, is what he said. He's like, because why would my daughter, she was born, and there was like a handicap ramp going up to the house and stuff. He's like, if, why would my daughter be born deformed? And why, my, my best friend, he died so young. 
Why would that happen? Why would a good God do that? And so you couldn't see it. Brother Stan couldn't see it. And I'm just like listening to the guy like courteously like this. But as he's saying all this, I'm like, oh, Lord, what do I say to this? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm praying to the God of heaven right there. I'm like, oh, man, deformed daughter. Okay, let me go into my deformed daughter file. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, sometimes like it's going to happen. It's going, trust me, it's going to happen. And in those key moments, if you try, if you don't think to pray to God first, if you think to like, oh, I got this, you know, you're going to, you're going to fail. The only way God said, if you just open your mouth, he will get, he will fill your mouth. He will give you the words, right? Was it Moses who was telling him, I am, I'm a man of, of slow speech. I, I can't do this. And, he, and, and God says, who made your mouth? Who, who made your mouth? God, God is in control. So like when you're, when you're going out to build something for God, and that's what we're doing when we're going door knocking, we're trying to build up some cities. We're, the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. So we're trying to go at, to these people who their father is the devil. We're trying to snatch them out of that city and put them into this city. And so uh, the reason I'm bringing this part up is because also uh, piggybacking off of Brother Tom, there is something for you to do. So this isn't a question today of, oh, can I do this? Can I do that? No. If, if you're going to do anything at any point in your life for God, these things are going to happen. So I want to basically beat the devil to the punch or beat our flesh to the punch, beat the world to the punch. I want us to be prepared so that when these things do happen and they will happen, we know exactly what to do. We know exactly what to do. Who was it that said I came prepared with the pen today? Was that you, Sister Barbara? Yeah, I had a pen earlier. I did my time. I'm like, anyone need a pen? And she's like, oh, no, I came prepared. Something as little as that, right? Something as little as that. No, I, I got a pen. I'm good. So when these things happen, when you have the sadness and the fear and that open door, that crucial moment, I mean, it could be someone you've been praying for for years that you never thought there'd be an open door and then God will put it on you like that. And in those moments, you need to be like Nehemiah and you need to pray through that open door. You need to pray through that open door. And the whole being a salesman thing, I feel like I have a bad rap now because I actually do work in sales. <laughs> but, um, but amen, if God can use my sales, Woo, amen. I'll do whatever. I'll, it, short of compromising, I'm never going to compromise um, salvation, the Bible, any of that stuff. But when it, when it comes to soul winning, dealing with people, an effective Christian has to be light on their feet. You got to be able to go with the flow. You got, um, like that same week, I think it was, that Catholic guy that ended up getting Amen. saved. When we go and we start witnessing to him, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm Catholic. And so what they teach you in sales is you don't disagree with them. Like, don't be like, oh, what are you doing that for? Like, you know, what are you going to, you, 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 you like acknowledge them. You align with what they're thinking, you know, so that they relate to you and feel validated. And then you give them the hook. Then you try to give them your thing. So with this guy, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, Catholic. So, you know, I'm sure, you know, as, as Christians, uh, we agree on a lot of stuff like the Trinity, you know, that uh, God, uh, Jesus was God in the flesh and stuff like that, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And what we'll find, and you won't find this if you're not going out, but if you go out, you'll find most, a lot of the time when people say, oh yeah, I'm Catholic, they don't even know what that means. They're, it's purely by family and tradition. So when I, so if I can get a, oh yeah, you're Catholic. Okay. Yeah, whatever. Um, do you believe, uh, in Jesus Christ, the, the blood that he shed on the cross, that that's the only way that you can go to heaven, not about going to church, not about confessing your sins to a priest, not about doing the rosary. And I brought all these things up at a later time, but I got him to admit that he agreed, um, with our initial point. You, uh, you have to be at a moment's notice praying, be ready to pray and push through that prayer, uh, that open door and pray through it. And then also you got to be able to go with, go with the flow. And so when you, when you prepare yourself for this stuff, you get ready and you, pre you get prepared. This is the biggest thing you could be, you could have the biggest gift of gab. You could be able to like dance around stuff, but if God is not in it, people are going to see through it. So you got to be praying to God, like at a moment's notice and he'll give you the words. And that's how people will get saved. Um, 
It's funny, at work, actually, the other day, I don't remember how they got talking about this, but one of my coworkers, he goes, yeah, my friend said, uh, if you can sell religion, you can sell anything, in reference to, they all know I'm a Christian, and one of my buddies was like, uh, said something about, oh yeah, he wants to be a pastor, and uh, one of my coworkers said that, he's like, oh yeah, I heard, uh, if you can sell religion, you can sell anything, and I was like, well, brother, and what happened? In that moment, I'm like, okay, God, what do I say to this? <laughs> and I, I, it just came out. I was like, well, uh, that's a great point. That's a great point. But I tell you, I tell you what, um, I guess I got into the wrong field of religion sales because I'm a part of the only one where what I'm selling is completely free. I like, I have, Amen. there's, Amen. I, I have nothing, I have nothing that I can get from you getting this. And so, those little, seemingly, t- and then you say, what happened next? nothing we just went on to the next thing it was just one little comment out of nowhere but those li- those open doors you never know when they're going to come so that's why it's so important whether you're young whether you're old whoever you are like brother tom said get in church go to bible study if you can do discipleship that pastor is freely offering for us to do online Amen. and meanwhile there's people out in virginia meeting in a restaurant on Sundays that are dying for someone like pastor. And we're over here, we get them every week. And what happens? We're spoiled. We're spoiled. Right, we, we should be, I mean, people have to pay for the type of education that he's offering online. And just from these sermons and teachings, people have to pay. Well, I mean, people pay stupid sums of money to go to just a regular college, That's but I, I'm I talking about even just like Christian seminaries, which is, like one step down from a regular college, I guess now, like people pay money to go to those and it's offered to us for free. So that's why it's so important for us to be prepared and you're not going to get prepared if you're not here. So anyways, sorry that I parked on that one, but Nehemiah, he was prepared to pray through that open door. And B, you need to be prepared to pray through your heart. Look at verse five. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, why? That I may build it. So you see here, when Nehemiah, he prays through that open door, and we're to assume God gives him the words to say, right? He prays to the God of heaven, the king blesses it, he goes off, he builds it, everything. How does he come at the king? This is, this is, this stuff like this really pops out to me. Immediately after praying to God, like immediately, what, how does he come at the king? If it please the king, submissive. If thy servant have found favor in thy sight, genuine, humble. And what is he doing? He's referencing his testimony that he has with the king. That's what he's doing. When he says, if I found favor in thy sight, what is the king going to think when he's saying that? He's thinking of all the days that Nehemiah's, you know, he's whistling to work. Hey, what's up, king? There you go, sir. You know, he's happy. He's faithful. He probably listens to the king, you know, when the king's got problems and stuff. Um, He's referencing his testimony, and he's coming with a pure, honest heart, and it's a selfless prayer request. He's, He's asking... King, please send me over here so I can build my city for my people. So it's a lot harder to say no when someone asks you a question that doesn't even benefit them. It's like someone else. You know what I mean? Like if I ask my, we're we're allowed like a certain amount of hours of overtime per week at at work. But I, I wonder if it's like, it's probably a lot harder for a boss to say like, hey, Hey, you know, boss, um, I was wondering, is it okay if I, if I get one more hour of overtime today? Because, uh, John, he's, his daughter's got a dance recital tonight and he was hoping if he could get out an hour early, would it be okay if I stayed and I worked for him? Like if that was me and I'm the manager, I'm like, yeah, why are you even asking me? Like, no question. Yeah, go ahead. Let him go to his daughter's dance recital. And so Nehemiah, this is very wise. This, this is wisdom as a serpent, harmless as a dove right here. So you need to be prepared to pray from the heart, from your heart. And this is the importance of a good testimony with people as well. If I didn't have a good testimony at work, and I'm not, I pray that I do. I don't know that I do. But if I at least didn't have a good enough testimony where my coworkers were comfortable coming up to me and giving, even giving me a hard time sometimes about religion, you know, like don't be so thin skinned. 
like that, my one coworker, he gave me a jab. And when you're able to take that and just come right back at him, that I feel like that sits with people. So um, Proverbs 16, verse seven says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. So it's so important to have a good testimony, a good aura, if you will, ambiance about you. Even if you're just, you know, you just got a quiet smile on your face at work. People, they catch on to that stuff. And so if I were you, I would try to pre be prepared and start now at work, not just work, but amongst fa lost family, loved ones, whatever. Start to try to have that good, get that good testimony and have them know you got a good heart. Because I'm sure a lot of us here can say when you first got saved, like when I first got saved, I was completely different. I was known for being sharp tongue. Like I would clown you so fast if we're all, I was the main one in our group of buddies that would be like Josh and everyone and would be, you know, stirring the pot and stuff. And so I had a lot to overcome with that when I first got saved um, at work and amongst friends and stuff. And it takes time. It takes time of them seeing that your heart has really been changed. And this is, by the way, this is when it comes to other people, lost souls, coworkers, even God, this is so important. When you come to God with a prayer request, and he can see that you have a genuine heart about it. Your intentions are pure. And it's for someone else and trying to help them. You got you to gotta believe that's, that's going to be a lot easier for God to answer. Assuming it's according to his will and for his purpose, that he's going to answer that on the spot. Um, so Nehemiah, he had wisdom here. And he prayed for that wisdom. But he also, it was from his heart. 1 Peter 3.16, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you... As of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So you also don't know, you know, let's say some coworkers are talking bad about you behind your back. You don't know what's happened when they've tried to do that. And maybe another coworker that saw that you had a good testimony, maybe they stood up for you. And it's so important um, to have a good heart and pray from the heart and deal with people from the heart. That's one thing once I got, I started to gain wisdom with dealing with people. In the beginning, I'm like, oh man, I, could, I just need to prove to someone that scientifically you cannot explain away these prophecies and it's mathematically you know, impossible that this happened, this happened, this happened. None of, if someone doesn't have the heart to hear it, it's just falling on deaf ears. So the first thing, the first thing you need to do, and all that, all that knowledgeable stuff is great too. But if someone doesn't have the heart for it, it's not going to matter. So you're going to get you're going to get further with God, with people, with friends, with lost people when you're dealing with them when they can see that it's coming from a pure heart. And that's why pa I mean, who here when they met pastor walked away after I, I had been searching for like a year and a half, I come in and I meet this guy and the first thing out of my mouth after the uh, service was over, I said Hey, yeah, I've got a question for you. Uh, do you believe the King James Bible is the absolute word of God? And he's, um, without missing a beat, he's like, in fact, actually looking back on it, I, could, I can see in my mind's eye some surprise on his, because we get all these people coming in now, right, that don't know yeah. anything or they're messed up. So to think for him, me, Daniel, Alex, we all came in that day. The first thing I come up, I'm like, do you believe the King James Bible? <laughs> he must have been, he was probably saying, oh, Lord, don't let me come across as like too pumped up right now. Like, yeah, brother, we do. Yeah. And so he's so, uh, he's so pure. That was the one thing that I really took away from when I met him. I'm like, wow, this guy is like pure and everything. He would always be patient with me. And I had all these questions about the post-trib rapture because I had literally just watched the after the tribulation documentary before I came to his church and I emailed him a bunch of questions. I was brand new, completely, only a brand new Christian could get sucked into that stuff. Amen. So I was completely didn't know anything about the Bible. And so I sent him all these questions and what did he do? He graciously, patiently answered each and every one of them. And so that, that is, that might be the most important thing of all of this in terms of preparation is praying through your heart and just dealing with people from the heart. And Nehemiah did that in this verse. He came at the king from his heart and it was selfless to build someone else's city. 
And what happens? The, the king blessed it. Amen? He blessed it. Um, one last thing on, on my workplace, I guess. I've been, it was the last week of our quarter, so I was, like, working just nonstop. So I have a lot of that on my mind. But I still try to, like, pay attention to stuff so I can use it. Um, we have, like, a quarterly goal. And so every one of my coworkers, it was a rough quarter. And every one of my coworkers was so stressed out. Because they're keeping track. How many how many credits do you have? How many credits do you? Have? Oh, I'm this many away. I gotta sell, I gotta do this. I gotta you know sell this many. I gotta do this, and then it literally became like an ongoing joke because they would come up to me and they'd be like, Sean, how many credits are you at? I'd be like, I don't know. It, what do you mean you don't know? I, I I don't look at numbers, and they'd be like, what? What what do you? How do you know if you're gonna hit goal? I, I just show up to work. I do my best every day, and um, if I hit goal, that means that. God blessed it. If I don't hit goal, that means that God knows I didn't need that extra money. Amen. That's good. Wow. That's and like you, when you, it, when you come at people like that, it literally, be, like for this whole week, people would come up because they would forget. So they'd come up, hey, Sean, how many credits? Oh, I forgot you don't look at credits. How many credits do you have? And I just, every, I'd just be like, nope, don't look at credits. And like, so the last day, like no one had hit their goal. And the last day, everyone's like, they're just scrambling. What can I do doing all this stuff? I just come up, hey, how's it going? And they're like, oh, man. Like, you can see the angst on their face. And they're like, I'm not going to hit goal. I'm not going to do this. Are you there? Did you hit it? I was like, I don't know. I was like, but I'm free as a bird. I I can't say that. I was like, and I asked him, I said, let me ask you this question. You're this many credits away, right? How has you, knowing how many credits away from goal you are, how has that helped you sell? And they're, they're like, it hasn't. No, it hasn't. Because you're tight. You I could literally feel the, like the desperation coming off of you. Like if I was a customer, I'd be so freaked out. But you're like, just no. You just gotta buy today. Like, yeah, you could buy tomorrow, but don't you just want to buy today? Like, it's weird, right? So if you have just a good heart about you, a good attitude, it'll get you a long way. Now, caveat on that. That's not to say that's all you need. Okay. C. You need to be prepared to pray through your head, through your head. So you've probably learned as a Christian, it's like you can never do anything right. At least that's how I feel. (laughs) I'll do like, okay, I got this down. Oh man, I forgot that part. So it's like, it's not enough to just only with your heart, just jump out on faith and just don't think about it. No, you have to be prepared to use your head. God gave us brains for a reason and it's totally okay to be reasonable. Uh, Look in verse six. It says, and the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and what? And I set him a time. So Nehemiah, before he even approached the king, he had a plan. He had taken some time. He prayed about it. He used his head. He's like, okay, what can I do? How can I get this done? What do I need? Okay, I need some timber. I need uh, some letters that I can take to the governors so that they give me stuff. I need protection. Uh, It's probably going to take this long. Like he set all of that stuff. He put it all into place beforehand. And so pastor does that too. Like when, I mean, we started doing door knocking literally just right this street right here. And what did he do? He mapped out. Okay, we did that street. That one's done. Now we're going to go here next. Um, Based on how long it's taken us this, it's pro- you know, we'll probably have this street done by this amount of time. If we had this many people, we get it done twice as fast, but we don't. So it's taking this amount of time. It's okay to just be logical and reasonable. Look in verses 7 and 8. Not only did he set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. So he needed some letters. He needed some escorts. He needed to go over the river and a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house. I mean, look at all these details. And for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according what? To the good hand of my God upon me. So if you are praying all the time, you're praying from the heart, you're praying with your head, and you're literally like, just, it's okay, just talk to God. God, should I do it like this? Should I do it like that? I don't know. Last time I said this, it didn't really work out. What do you think? Should I try this? And then just, and then just listen, and then just listen. Pray with your head 
it's okay to plan stuff out. And it's so funny because in the world, whether it's school or the workplace, we're all expected to like put together these presentations, like put together a PowerPoint and like, this is your goal for this quarter. How are you going to do it? How many of these do you have to sell a day to do it? A week. How many people need to come into your store for you to do it? All of these numbers, all of this stuff that we, we are literally forced to know the answer to. And yet when it comes to spiritual things, we don't, what? What, what, do, what do we got? What are we, what, what are we actually planning? What are we actually planning to do or thinking about? We're very lazy spiritually. So you need to be prepared to use your head. If you want to accomplish something for God, literally set out, how can I do this? How can I do this? Sit down and write some stuff on a paper or type it in a computer, whatever you have to do. Logically sit down and reasonably figure out, okay, what do I need to do this? How much time am I going to need? Um, how much time do I have? Okay, when can I commit time to do this? Who, can I, who else can I get to try to help me with this? Like all kinds of those simple questions that you automatically think of at work, but you never think of when it comes to the things of God. So you need to use your head. My third point is you need to be prepared to persevere. So be prepared to push, be prepared to pray, and be prepared to persevere. A, through your protection. Look at verse 9. Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. So Nehemiah, he's got backup, right? He's got backup. He's probably strutting into town. Uh, he's got the king's guard behind him. He's got papers. He's got authority behind him. And he's marching into, into their territory, going, literally serving them their papers. Like, hey, you're done. I'm coming in. We're building this. And spiritually, this is exactly what we do when we go door knocking. We're coming with backup. We got brothers and sisters um, that are going to be there praying for us, right? Instantly. Um, in the moment as we're witnessing, we got back up and, oh, would you look at this? I got the king's letter right here. Amen. I, got Amen. I, I, I got something the king signed right here. And it says uh, that you're going to hell if you, <laughs> I'm not, I wouldn't literally say this like in the first part, maybe the last part. Um, you're going to hell if you don't get out of the burning house you're in called yourself and your works and your religion. And if you come in to Jesus Christ, you need Jesus Christ. So spiritually, that's literally what we're doing. And so you need to know it's okay to be bold for Jesus. It's okay to speak with authority. Like today when that guy pulled up in the gas station out street preaching, he was like one of these like Gnostic philosophy, like went to college and like thought he was smart guys. And he's like, you know, there's all kinds of stuff, right? How do you know what you got is the truth? And then I would try to explain it and he would cut me off. And then he would say like, oh yeah, but how do you know this? He's just asking questions. And then so I was like, okay, so uh, let me ask you this. How do you know what you believe is true? And he's like, well, no, 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 I'm not saying about me. I'm just asking like, like he, it's funny. He was very quick to like ask me questions, but when I would turn around, he would have no answer. And so what I find is if you have like this scared kind of spirit about it and someone comes to you, and again, it's okay to have that good heart, but we're to season it with salt. We're to give it a little spice, you know what I mean? Like at work when I said that, I'm like, oh, you know, I must be in the wrong business because my religion is for free. Um, it's okay to, to give them a little something back, but you do it with a good heart, but it's okay to have confidence. And I assure you, Nehemiah had confidence right here. He had the king backing him up. Amen. And good. so that's what we're doing when we go door to door. That's why, and I'm sure you all have struggled with this. I did in the beginning too. I'm like, oh man, like, what do I, I, if I say this or, or going away from it, you're like, I should have said this. Or man, God, oh, I messed up there. I'm so stupid. I don't know the Bible yet. What am I doing? I shouldn't be out here. You see the, how easy it is to just like slide down that discouragement road. Even if you don't, even if you feel like you're not ready, you don't know this book enough yet. You do know enough. You do know Jesus Christ is the only way. And you would, again, when we were talking about the heart, you'd be surprised how little, how little Bible you really need to like, you don't have to take someone through like 20 verses to show them how to get saved. It's incredibly easy. Some people, I mean, a lot of country folk, they don't even read that well or know the Bible that well. But what happens? Their heart, their testimony, they got this charisma about them, that Southern hospitality. You can see the kindness in them, but most of all, what? They are 
confident in what they believe in. They know they're going to heaven. And they'll, 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 they'll tell you about what Jesus did for them. Like if nothing else, you can, you can persevere knowing that you're protected. Obviously, you have the good hand of God upon you, but you're on the winning side. Like don't lose sight of that. The people in this room in hopefully not very long are going to be on the winning side. We're not going to yeah. be here anymore. That's right. And so even if you fall flat on your face, you don't have an answer at all. You should even walk away from that confident like, man, Lord, I messed that up. But hey, get this guy saved. I, I'm saved. Get him saved anyway. Is there, hey, Amen. figure out a way for him in the tribulation to, I don't know, get saved, get his head cut off or something. Um, like, <laughs> it's okay to be confident even if you're even, like, you would be surprised how much confidence would get you. How do you think all these cults work? These guys don't have any Bible for this stuff. It's confidence. It's I'm confident and I know what I'm saying. And I'm, you know what I mean? Like, how did Hitler get all those, all those Jews killed? He was like a great speaker and confident and strong. And so Nehemiah was right here. So it's okay to be confident just so long as your confidence is in God and you're relying on him. And Nehemiah did that. Last thing I have for you is uh, you need to be prepared to persevere through your enemy through your enemy. Look in verse 10, in verse 10 of Nehemiah right here. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10. Let me switch back to it. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly. Why? That there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Now, if there's one thing you need to be prepared for, it's to meet your enemy. Because if you're going out to build anything for God, and we've seen that firsthand literally in this room, right? You're going to meet your enemy. So a, a, a huge reason why we need to be prepared on all these things is for when that moment comes, you want to be able to, to hold your own. You want to be able to, to push through them. And so that's, again, why it's so important that we're preparing ourselves today. That's why it's so important that you need to come to as many church activities as you can. You need to be reading your Bible every single day. You need to pray for others. You need to go to street preaching if you can. You need to go pass out some tracks. Go look like a fool and go in a parking Amen. lot and just go, just pass out tracks. Get rejected a bunch of times. It's really good for you. It's really good experience. That's why it's so important for us to be here today. And I thank God that we are all here today because what are we doing? We're trying to prepare ourselves and equip ourselves with the things we need. As soon as we leave this room today, we're going we're gonna to meet the enemy. We're going to be confronted with sadness, with fear, with all of these things, maybe some open doors, right? And so that's why it's so important for us to get through these things. And the last thing I want you to notice is in that verse, why were they exceedingly grieved? Because there was come a man. And it's funny, all it's ever taken to upset everything, all the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the devil, the elites, everything, one man. Amen. It took one Jesus Christ. Well, it took one Adam to condemn the whole world with his sin. And it took one Jesus Christ to save the entire world. It took one Moses to deliver his people out of Egypt. It took one Stephen. He got those Jews so mad they were gnash, tearing him, his flesh with their teeth, stoning him, everything. It took one Paul to turn the entire world upside down and take the gospel to the Gentiles. It only ever takes one man. And it took one Dr. Peter S. Ruckman to turn the entire fundamental Bible-believing community on its head to where we could, we could rest assured that we have the pure words of God and we could have that confidence and that protection when we go out into the world. And I'll tell you this, he's just one man, in my opinion, but he is, he is some man. Pastor Gene Kim, uh, aside from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, if there's one uh, man that I have to thank and that I have gratitude for, for everything that I have gotten since the moment I got saved, it's him. And Brother Tom touched on it, but it only took one Asian kid who went to UC Berkeley Amen. and started a little tiny church in the Bay Area where, like, does it really make sense that there's no Bible-believing churches in the Bay Area? Like, this is one of the most 
densely populated place. I think it's probably because most Bible believers don't even want to come here. It's just so wicked and filthy. That's right. So it takes one man to make such a difference. All of you who are in this room today and have been blessed by knowing this book and all of you watching online that have access to dispensational Bible believing truth, you, you can't underestimate that and discount that. There's most people in this world, they don't have a book that they could put all their faith in. And that's because of the one man they're following, whether it be the Antichrist coming up, the false prophet, a Joel Osteen. It only takes one man to either completely ruin something or to build something up. So like Brother Tom said, it's not a question of, can I do this? I can't do this. I can't do this. There is something, no matter how young you are, no matter how old you are, God has given you something. Maybe you can sing. Maybe you can play an instrument. Maybe you can teach. Maybe you can preach. Maybe you can just smile and just be a nice like person that, that's approachable, that someone will come to and ask you about Jesus. Maybe you are a good driver. You have a license where you can drive a bus and we can get a bus ministry going. Maybe you can draw. Maybe you can write. Maybe you can't do any of those things, but you can pray. At the judgment seat of Christ, there, no one will have an excuse, okay? And so God has given each and every one of us a talent, something we can do, and we ought to prepare ourselves if we wish to build something for God so that when those times come, and they will, that we'll be ready. And when pastor comes back, let's try to be more ready than we were before he left when he gets back. Amen. Let's try to, Amen. don't they say that like it's not like good manners, like leave a place cleaner than you found it. Yeah. We should try to be, we should have our own, this should be our own little mini revival to where when pastor comes back, we're pumped up, that pumps him up. And then we're all pumped up as we go to summer camp. Amen. Amen. So then we get crazy pumped up and then we just look crazy <laughs> and we come back and then we're, just, you know what I mean? Um, that That's what I have for you today, okay? We need to be prepared for this stuff, all right? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Um, I'll open the altar call up one more time. I guess you have twice, you have doubled the opportunity to come down on the altar today. Um, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you haven't been saved that long, or you've been saved a very long time, there's something that the Lord has for you. He's put on your heart. He's given you talent in some area. He's given you strengths. And even the weaknesses you have, He can use those for strengths because his strength is made perfect in weakness. And so I want to be prepared. I don't know about you. I feel like everyone in this room does, but I want not just me to be prepared. I want my brothers and sisters here to be prepared. So that's what the Lord gave me today to give you. I'll give you a little time to pray. Get some things right with the Lord. Maybe plan something out in your mind, through your heart, of logically what you can do for him. Father, thank you so much for this church. Brothers and sisters in this church that I would not trade for this world. I wouldn't trade for my own family. Jesus said, who is my mother or brother or sister? Them that do the will of God. And it's sad that some of us have relatives that won't be with us in heaven, but I thank you, God, every single day that I have brothers and sisters that I can look in the face that I'm gonna be with for eternity. And that's what we're here to get prepared for today. We're trying to prepare ourselves for eternity. And not just for meeting our enemy, but meeting our maker. And that day is going to come very soon, Lord. So I pray that those watching online, those in this room today, that you would use this for your honor and glory. That you would equip us with what's needed. So we can make the preparations needed to actually go out and actually build something for you, Lord. Please bless the rest of this day. Get everyone home safe. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. 
As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.